Good morning, church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. May please start with the call to worship. We come joyfully to the house of the Lord. This is our gift and sacrifice and act of the devotion to the Lord, to God. Now may you please stand for the hymn of praise, Oh, How I Love Jesus. I love to sing His word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest day on earth. Oh, oh, how I love Jesus. Yes, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he hurts. Oh, it tells, it tells me of a Savior who died to be free. It tells me of his precious, oh, the sin is perfectly whole, oh, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, yes, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first, it tells, it tells, Loving heart can fill my deepest woe. Who in his sorrow bears a bandit can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Yes, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first up. Oh, how I love Jesus, yes, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love 
Now we will have the opening prayer by Paris Lawton, followed by the choral response, I don't mind waiting. Thank you, God, for this new day. Thank you for rest and for shelter, for health and for food. Thank you for friends and family. Thank you for challenges and for opportunities to learn. May this day be filled with love, and may we know that you are always near. In your name we pray, amen. I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting on the Lord. I don't. May you please stand for the affirmation of faith found on page 881 by Freddie Lawton III. I believe in God the Father, heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born on the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May you please remain standing for the Psalter found on page 750 in United Methodist Hymnal. We'll be re reciting the response. The law of God is just reviving the soul. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. In them God has sent a tent for the sun, which comes forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and runs its course with joy like a strong man. The law of God is just reviving the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul.
The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, is keeping them, there is great reward. Also keep your servant from the insolent. Let them not have dominant over, him, over me. The law of God is just reviving the soul. May you please remain standing for the offering. You may be seated. Now we will have a children's moment by Ms. Carmelita Lawton. Good morning. Today I have prayer journals for you. And each of them say, pray and never give up. Folders and some of you will get um, composition books for the older ones. Before you receive them, I'm going to tell you a parable, and a parable is a story that Jesus told his disciples, which are his followers. This information can, uh, this parable can be found in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 18. Does everyone know what a judge does? Does anyone want to say what is a judge, Coleman? A judge is somebody like if someone breaks the law, they decide whether they like go in prison or not. Very good. The judge decides whether they are guilty or not guilty. And he has that gavel and he wraps it on the um, podium there. So a judge helps people uh, to tell them what is fair. Okay, like Colin was saying. Jesus said in the story that a woman, I'm sorry, Jesus said in the story, what the woman said to the judge, there is a man who is not being fair to me. He must give me my rights. And at first the judge refused to do anything, but the woman, she kept asking and asking. 
And finally, the judge said, okay, this woman is bothering me. I will see that she gets her rights so that she will not bother me and wear me out anymore. After Jesus, Jesus finished the story, he said, learn a lesson from the judge. God's people cry to him day and night. God will always give them what is right, and he will not be slow to answer them. I tell you, God will help his people quickly. Have you ever found yourself in a situation that was hard, that you just wanted to give up? Maybe you were having trouble with getting your schoolwork done, or you had to get caught up because um, somehow you got you behind on some things. Or maybe there was you had problems with a classmate. Maybe they were being unkind to you. So in those situations, what can you do? Like the judge, what could we do? I'm sorry, like the woman went to the judge. When we're having troubles, what can we do? What'd you say? God. We can pray to God and we can ask him for help. Right? We don't have to just go to him one time. We can go to him more and more. Jesus wants us to learn from this story that God, our Heavenly Father, loves us and wants to be nice, wants to do nice things for us. He wants what's best for us, and he has the wisdom to know what is best. So don't forget, God likes to hear us ask, not just once, but again and again. He doesn't want us to ask once and then give up. He wants us to keep the faith, trust, and believe in him. Like the woman who continued to go to, to the judge, he wants us to continue to seek him in prayer. So with your journals, I hope that you will use your prayer journals. I just put a template in there where you can write your prayer requests, your needs, and your prayer for the day. And if you want to copy more of those, you can copy and put them in your journal or just follow the template. Um, just use the prayer journals as a reminder to ask God to help you when you have a problem that makes you want to give up. Don't let that problem defeat you. Have your faith and trust in God. Our prayer is thank you, God, that you hear our prayers. Please help us to pray and never give up. Amen. Now we will have a musical selection by the choir, How Great Is Our God. The splendor of a king Oh, the majesty Let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light. A dog that tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all oh, will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age, 
to stand. May please recite the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as your scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Now we will have the scripture readings by Franklin Lawton. Please turn your Bible to page 1076. Today I'll be reading Jeremiah chapter. Today I'll be reading chap Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 27 through 34. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow, that I will sow, saith the Lord, 
that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict so that I will watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. In those days they shall say no more, the, feather, the fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But every one shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of, Is- of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I have made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was in, I was in a husband to unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with Israel, with the house of Israel. After those days, the Lord I will the Lord I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and and will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his na- his neighbor and every man his his brother saying no saying no the Lord for they shall all know from me the least of them unto the greatest of them saith the lord for i will forgive them their iniquity and i will remember them their sin no more today i've read chapter 31 jeremiah jeremiah chapter 31 verse 27 through 34 may the lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of your holy word And may you please turn your pages in your pew Bible to page 1,424. I'll be reading Luke chapter 16, verse 19 to 31. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sub, sum, sumptuously, sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at the gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs, which fell from the rich man's table, more overing the dogs, came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was, a, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and in hell he lifted he lift up his eyes, being the torments, and Seth seeth Abraham afar, and Lazarus in his bosom. He, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in his flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivedest receivedest thy god things and likewise Lazarus evil things but now he is come he's comforted and thou tormented and beside all this between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from the from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us what would come 
from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brother men that he may testify unto them. He may testify unto them, lest they also come unto this place of torment. Abraham saith unto them, Prophets, let the let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Today I have read Luke chapter chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. May the Lord add the blessing to the hearers and doers of his holy word. May you please remain standing for the hymn of preparation. Every praise is to our God, following by the morning message by Miss Crystal Young. Every praise, every praise to our God, every every worship and what I call every praise, every praise, every praise is to is to our God. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to our God, glory. Yes, to our God, every praise. Every praise is to, is to our God. Now won't you take it a little higher? Every, every praise is to our God. Every yes, and for every praise. Every praise is to, is to our God. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to our God. To our God, every praise, every praise is to, is to our God. Let's take a little bit higher than that. Every praise is to our God, every, every word of worship and one accord. Every praise, every praise, every praise is to, is to our God. Hallelujah, sing hallelujah to our God. Yes, to our God, every praise, every praise is to, is to our God. Listen here. God, my Savior, God, my dear. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Come on and say, God. God, my Savior. God, my healer. My healer. Yes, he is. 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 Every praise to our God, every worship and water, every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise, when you see me dancing, every praise, when you see me praising him, every praise, when I'm down and out, every praise. Every praise is to, is to our God. Amen. Every praise is to our God. 
There's not one praise that we cannot give to God. God is always there for us. He's always there to listen. We're never alone. And we thank God for his presence in our lives. So I want to chuckle a little bit. So we were at church one Sunday. I was kind of minding my business. And our pastor comes up to me and says, oh, I want you to, um, to speak on the third Sunday in October. I said, you want me to speak? She said, well, you're a late speaker, aren't you? I said, well, yeah. She said, okay, well, then it's, it's your turn to speak. <laughs> so I said, well, okay. And of course, she gave me a couple of months notice. So, I mean, I was good with that. So, but I love our pastor and we have developed a great relationship especially with the passing of my mother. Um, I don't know what I would have done without her and a lot, of, a lot of you here today. So I just thank God for our pastor. So I had to think about what I wanted to speak on. First, I had thought about love. I'm like, yeah, okay. And then something came to me and said, we need to do it on forgiveness. Because there's a lot going on in our community and all over the world. And then a voice came to me and said, it needs to be forgiveness and reconciliation. So I said, well, I need to read up about this. See how the two of them, you know, go together. So um, today's message comes from Colossians, third chapter, 12 through the 13 verses, which states, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So like I mentioned earlier, I chose this to topic because of the relentless, unrelentless amount of hate and violent crimes going on, really running rampant throughout our community and even outside the country. There is dissension and disputes all around us, ongoing and sometimes never ending conflicts between family members, friends, spouses, neighbors, races, cultures. And as a society, we have, we have become selfish right? Very angry. We're divided, uncontrollable at times, greedy, and we become broken. The world is becoming an increasingly frightful, hateful, and toxic place to live and thrive. In Matthew 24 chapter, 12th verse, Jesus warned us that in the last days, the love of many would grow cold. And in our time, we are seeing those words being fulfilled. And Lord knows that we can become quite vicious in our attempts to seek revenge against others. Many lives have been taken because we have become so bitter and angry, speaking evil of others. And somehow, in our minds, we've actually justified this inappropriate behavior. But when this occurs, we have succumbed to the devil and his ungodly teachings. Church, forgiveness is at the heart of our Christian faith. Christ died to forgive our sins and to reconcile us to God. Jesus taught that his disciples must forgive those who have sinned against them. So why would we not forgive? Are we above or exempt from God's teachings? Colossians 3, chapter 13, verse states, we must remember that the Lord forgave us, so we must forgive others. Forgiveness is when we no longer harbor those negative feelings or resentments towards someone, and we freely give up the right to get even. It doesn't even matter what someone may have done to us, but we're doing this because this is what we want to do, because we know that it's the right thing. One beautiful thing about forgiveness is that it doesn't require anything from the other person. In fact, the offender doesn't even have to know that we're forgiving them. You can keep that secret to yourself if you so choose. So you're doing this for yourself. But God truly desires for us to forgive and reconcile our differences with others. 
Remember the Samaritan woman? There are many reasons why Jesus could have just walked past her. She was a member of the hated mixed race, and she was a well-known sinner. Her own people in her community didn't accept her. They forced her to go and get water. Excuse me. In the midday, when it was extremely hot, all the other women went either early in the morning or late at night when it was cooler. But they didn't accept her because she was a sinner. But Jesus knew all about her reputation, and he still accepted her. For he knew that she was looking for love in all the wrong places. And through Jesus consistently showing her love and acceptance, she began to let go of her own shame and guilt and allowed herself to feel God's unconditional love and total forgiveness. She was so happy and encouraged. She began to witness to others in her community about the love of God. And eventually she became a messenger to the people in her community. Who but God knows and loves us so completely, yet still accepts us even with our own individual imperfections. Nowadays, celebrities and other well-known people tend to make us think that imperfections is something that's um, unacceptable. So what are they doing? A lot of us are listening to what they're saying for whatever reason. And if we feel that there's something wrong with us, we try to go and get it fixed. Some of us pay more attention to man than to God. And we should have never taken our eyes off of God. But forgiving can be difficult because it's an unselfish act that requires us setting aside our own strong and, and, and ambivalent feelings and voluntarily releasing the person from the obligation to apologize. At times, accomplishing this task can be quite difficult for us to process. And sometimes, you know, people are really, really mean. And you just say, God, look at what they've done. Look at what they're doing to me over and over again. But God commanded us to forgive our offenders. In fact, he commanded us over and over to forgive our, our offenders. Mark 11, chapter 26, verse states, but if you do not forgive, neither will your father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. But at times we fail to take heed to his word, and this is not pleasing in God's eyes. Colossians 3, chapter 13, verse states that not only are we to forgive, but we are to forgive without punishing. But sometimes we get so upset with someone, just the thought of that we think is unheard of. There is just no way I will ever forgive them for what they've done. We not only fail to forgive, but we also intentionally punish the person who allegedly offended us. We'll stop speaking to them, talk badly about them to others, attempt even um, to turn others against them, put them at risk of potential harm and danger, and even intentionally take someone's life. That's how bitter we've become. Just look at that violent act of unfortunate deaths occurring right here in our county and surrounding communities. The many senseless and cruel acts of violence happening daily, all because we choose to harbor negative feelings and we choose not to forgive. In Corinthians second chapter 10 through 11 verses and Hebrews 12 chapter 15, Paul warned us that when we fail to forgive, Satan has outwitted us, and a root of bitterness begins to grow within us. The last thing we should want is for our hearts to become bitter. 
For when this happens, we become unhappy with ourselves and everything around us. The activities that we used to enjoy, we don't get pleasure from them anymore. We tend to withdraw and go into ourselves and even distancing ourselves from others and can even become evil spirited. And as time progresses, we become miserable, desperate. And we forget all about God. In fact, sometimes we call on, on anybody but God. Sometimes we feel because we can't see him, we can't touch him, we think that he doesn't exist and that he's really not watching. So we look to man. I can remember um, years ago, my cousin Albert, who lives in New York, he called down, he wanted the number to Dr. Buzzard. Yeah. Now, my cousin was way up in New York, but he had heard about Dr. Buzzard. He had a problem he felt that only Dr. Buzzard could help him with. And you see, he had become so desperate that he truly believed that God couldn't help him. So church, we should never rely on man for anything, for he'll disappoint. When we need him the most, he is not there. He's not answering the phone. He'll see us in the street, won't even acknowledge us. But God can turn anything around if it's his will. We have witnessed him saving souls, healing others, and forgiving his own offenders. But as an individual, we should want to forgive and ultimately reconcile with others to free ourselves from that heavy burden of hatred, bitterness, and, re and revenge. Because ultimately, we should want to be able to move for forward with our lives engaged in peace and harmony with one another. And in looking at things from a biblical perspective, forgiveness and reconciliation is also being willing and able to accept the offender as our brother and sister in Christ and commune with them in church. So there's a responsibility that we have and God is expecting us to do it. He has set so many examples we have the Beatitudes, if we're not sure of how we're supposed to conduct ourselves. So he has um, laid out all types of examples for us to follow. Luke 7, chapter 48, verse states, your sins are forgiven. Jesus told Peter to forgive his offenders 70 times 7. Now that's just an example, because basically there is no limit to how many times we can forgive someone. Sometimes we can hold one isolated instance against someone for a very, very long time. And you know, the sad thing about it is that sometimes the offender doesn't even know that they've offended us. Sometimes we can go on for so long that we forget why we're upset, but yet we still don't talk to them. We'll continue to hold a grudge, right? Yeah. But as a believer, we have the responsibility to take the initiative to take the first step in dealing with forgiveness. For we know all too well what God expects from us. And in all actuality, the only person truly being hurt is the person who fails to forgive. Who are we to judge and not forgive? For we're not perfect. And Lord knows from time to time, we're going to make mistakes. Our sins are no better than anyone else's. Sin is sin. It doesn't matter how smart, how popular, and or how wealthy we think we are. Luke 6, chapter 37, verse states, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. The only per perfect person is God. And if he can forgive, why can't we? He not only desires for us to make allowances for each other's faults, he also expects us to forgive. God expects more from his people because we're supposed to know what's right. And we're expected to set a good examples for others to follow and to emulate. 
And remember, God only dwells in a clean heart. So if our heart isn't clean, we are no better than the non-believer or the offender. Forgiveness doesn't excuse the offender's behavior, but it will prevent the offender's inappropriate behavior from destroying our hearts, our minds, and ultimately our souls. We can choose to forgive the offender even if they're not sorry. Forgiving not only releases us from carrying someone else's burden, but it ultimately frees us from the negative feelings and emotions that are attached to it. So we've forgiven that person, but they haven't. So it's their problem now. We've done what we need to do to clear our minds and our hearts and even our spirits. But while knowing that as Christians we must extend forgiveness to others, it's impossible to reconcile a relationship faithfully without mutual promises. Forgiveness is a promise to oneself, but reconciliation involves all of those who are concerned with that particular situation. Matt third, chapter 8, verse states, in order for a relationship to be reconciled, not only must the offender party, offended party make promises of forgiveness, but the offended party must repent of sins, promise to continue in repentance, and bear fruit in keeping with their professed repentance, repentance. So the operative words here are promise and keep. So you and your offender will have to keep working towards getting along and working through your concerns. You have to truly want to get along with one another and to forgive them of, of whatever they may have done where you may have felt wrong. We all know right from wrong and can benefit from making better choices when faced with everyday situations. But sometimes we get caught up in life's challenges, become angry, and truly forget about God, his guided teachings, and his expectations. As a child growing up, I can recall my mother and grandmother saying, God don't like ugly. That used to scare me because I never really knew what that truly meant. I would hurry up and correct my behavior. I was fearful of my mother, my grandparents, especially my father, and also God. I didn't want to find out what would happen if I didn't turn my behavior around. You know, nowadays, um, some of our students growing up, they don't fear authority. They don't believe in it, much of anything, you know, and it's, it's very, very sad. So as you can see, our relationship with God and others also becomes negatively impacted. And we fail to make um, bad choices and or forgive others. Matthew 6, chapter 15, verse states, our fellowship with God suffers when we refuse to release others from their sins against us. Let's take a look at our awesome God and how he exhibited forgiveness for all to see and emulate. Jesus was an innocent man, God's only son, whose sole purpose in life was to fulfill his father's will. He didn't sin, hurt anyone, and he cared more about others than himself. He taught about love, hope, forgiveness, and heaven. Yet they still crucified him. Instead of fighting back, what did he do? He turned the other cheek. And while in pure agony, he allowed them to nail him to a tree. He totally submitted himself to their cruelty. Now, he could have retaliated, but he chose to be obedient and follow God's commandments. 
Ephesians 4th chapter 31st to 32nd verses states, we must deliberately turn away from anger and malice. And while he was being tortured, Jesus began to pray, and he asked the Father to forgive those who sinned against them because they didn't know what they were doing. Jesus was our sacrifice for sin, the perfect example of one of God's sheep. What a capacity of forgiveness, considering he was the victim of the greatest injustice perpetuated by man. And nowadays, we will kill over something simple as a pair of tennis shoes. A friend of mine called me and was telling me that in his community, there was a shooting over 50 cents. Can you imagine? What can you buy with 50 cents? Not very much. Ephesians 4th chapter 32, 32nd verse reads, And be ye kind to one another tender-hearted and forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So we must forgive and be willing to reconcile our differences with others. Reconciliation is the final step in the forgiveness process. It's like putting the cherry on top, an extra bonus. Reconciliation can help break the cycle of hurt, harm, and violence. It can assist in building a more peaceful environment, ultimately keeping peace amongst ourselves and decreasing the risk of experiencing any post-traumatic stress episodes. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of us here, uh, we, we know about PTSD and we know about what it can do to our everyday living um, situations. Whatever our problem was, you have that PTSD because you have not forgiven, you're still holding grudges, it haunts you because you're going to have triggers because of what was going on that you have failed to let go. So the more we reconcile, the easier it is to identify and correct whatever is wrong with other people. Sometimes we have to forgive for past wrongs. And that, might, that may be the key to get along with others. We can hold grudges for a very, very long time. But by engaging honestly and respectfully with one another, we can also assist in building a new environment through meaningful and faithful relationships. The goal of this process is to decrease the desire to retaliate or maintain the isolation from the offender regardless of what they did. By doing this, we're setting ourselves free of the struggles. And this is a gift that we can give to ourselves. So turn it over to Jesus. He'll work it out. There is no problem that he cannot solve. And all through a long when we're having these trials and tribulations, we should have been praying to God anyway. We should have never took our eyes off of God. And last but not least, when we feel the problem is bigger than what we can handle appropriately, when we've exhausted all resources known, maybe, when, maybe we address things the wrong way and we knew we were addressing the wrong way. We, at that point, we know we have to turn it over to God because we failed in trying to resolve this concern. Church in today's world, we need God's protection to assist and intervene on our behalf. And I can recall um, the pastor saying to me one day, you don't have to carry the burden all, all by yourself. God is there. He's there to fight our battles so we can stop allowing others to continue to harm us and begin focusing on what we truly have control over and that is ourselves. And as Mr. Carter so eloquently sings in Psalms 27, first through third verse reminds us, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Church, we must be willing to extend mercy towards those who sin against us. For God has forgiven us so many times. There is no problem that he cannot solve. He is always available. He is waiting with outstretched arms, and he's ready to assist. He is an on-time God. Yes, he is. Amen. Let's bow our head in prayer, please. Oh, Lord, please look down on us and continue to help us when we are in need. Give us unlimited understanding and unlimited love to forgive and bless others as you have forgiven us. Lord, please remove the negative spirit that can dwell in our hearts and replace it with the same unconditional love and understanding that you demonstrated over and over again to us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we get ready for our altar call, as lay servant Crystal spoke to us this morning on forgiveness and reconciliation, as she was speaking, I heard God say, forgive so you can be forgiven. I don't know who he's speaking to this morning, but I heard him simply say, forgive so you can be forgiven. And she's told us so eloquently how, and she's given a scripture, on how to do this. As we prepare to go before his throne, if you're out of the ark of safety, you don't know Christ as your personal savior, you have not connected to the true vine, we give you this opportunity to step out on faith this morning. If you're in our WebEx community, community please call me so I can walk you through the sinner's prayer, 843-599-3786. The altar is open for those that would like to come to prayer. And I don't know why, Wesley, but God always has me say as the choir prepares to sing. If you're in a backslidden state, and he's had me right there because some of us is in a backslidden state and don't even realize that we've drifted away from God. God didn't leave us, church. We drifted away from him. But I need to let somebody know he's waiting on you with open arms. It doesn't matter. Step out in faith this morning and say, God, I surrender it all to you, God. I've been carrying this for too long, God, this unforgiveness, Lord. I surrender all. If God has sent you to connect to this body of Christ, I'm asking you to remain at the altar. Give us your hand, but be sure to give God your heart. As we sing and we prepare our hearts and minds for prayer, as we sing God has smiled on us, I want you to think about all that God has done for you and will continue to do for you, church. We cannot take it lightly. Smiled on me. He has set me free. God has smiled on me. He's been to me. God has smiled on me. He has set me free. 
God has smiled on me. Yes, it has. Yes, it has to me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we can never experience freedom until you've set us free. Because the word says, whom the son sets free is truly free indeed, God. Lord, as we gather around your altar this morning in the sanctuary, in our homes and in our hearts, God. I'm asking you, God, to do a heart circumcision on us this morning, God. Because you see our hearts, God. If you find unforgiveness, God. I'm asking you, God, to forgive us and teach us how to forgive in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm asking you to search our minds this morning, God. Let that mind that was in Christ Jesus be also in us, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, do a heart circumcision, God, creating us a clean heart, God, and renewing us the right spirit, God. Lord, fix our minds this morning in the name of Jesus so that we're able to keep our eyes on you this morning, God. As we come before you with our heads bowed and the lock of our shoulders, God. Lord, I'm asking you, God, to hear every petition, God, if it is your will in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm asking you to move, God. Lord, if we're praying out of your will, God, teach us how to pray, God. Allow the Holy Spirit to intercede, God. Teach us how to pray as you taught your disciples, God. Lord, I'm asking you, God, to do a hearing check this morning, God. Increase our hear spiritual hearing, God. Increase our spiritual sight, God, because there's so many distractions in this noisy world in the name of Jesus. Lord, you told us in our word, in your word, that if your people who were called by your name, God, would humble ourselves, God, turn from our wicked ways, God. Pray, you promised us, God, that you would hear from heaven and heal our land. God, our land need a healing this morning, God. We're in trouble, God. Lord, let us be your light, God. As we walk into the world, God, don't let us just talk, Jesus. Let us imitate Jesus, God. Let us spread the love, God, that this world so desperately needs, God. As we open our mouth, God, I'm asking you to speak through us in the name of Jesus. Lord, I lift the bereaving families up before you, God. I ask you to comfort them, God. I know you will because you promised in your word that those that moan would be comforted, God. And you're not a man that you will lie, God. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever, God. Lord, I just thank you, God. I thank you for the move here in Wesley in the name of Jesus. Lord, how we're witnessing your healing power in the name of Jesus. Your power of deliverance, God. I decree and declare, God, that as we walk into this new season, God, you've already ordered our steps, God. All we have to do is move our feet. Lord, I stand in the gap for the lost, God. They're standing at the crossroad trying to figure out which way to go. God, let them hear your small, still voice saying, come home, my child. Lord, we thank you, God. I thank you, God. I love you and I adore you, God. I'm asking you to pour a special blessing out on our youth this morning, God. Our young people are under attack by the enemy, God. Lord, I'm asking you for an increase of protection in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm asking you, God, I stand in the gap, God, and put the blood on the doorpost, God, that Satan will pass over our youth in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.
Now we will have the welcome of guests and parish concerns by Freddie Lawton III. Good morning. For the birthdays for the week of the 16th through the 22nd, we have Miss Crystal Yawn on the 17th and Byron Jones Sr. on the 17th also. Happy birthday to birthday we have one announcement from the wesley kids the west kids are asking for your help to support a thanksgiving outreach if you know any of any families in need please submit the names and contact information by november 6th to carmelita lawton or pastor glover if you would like to make a mo a monetary contribution or gift card in it will be greatly appreciated as well secondly the Wesley Kids will be joining Carteret United Methodist, United Methodist Church in its global outreach with Operation Christmas, Ch Christmas Child. We have seven boxes and are asking that five families or five committees join, join the Omers and Lawton family in this mission by taking a shoebox and filling it with love that will spread across the world to girls and boys in need. You are welcome to use your own shoebox to fill and donate to this cause. Let's help make this world a brighter place together and give us God so richly gives to us daily. We hope to multiply in our giving next year. Instructions are in the boxes. Boxes will be accepted until, until November 6th. Please feel free to contact Carmelita Lawton for assistance at 843-597-3862. Lastly, the Wesley kids are looking to donate locally during the Christmas holidays by adopting names of children in need. More information will be coming. Looking ahead, that's 6 p.m. be held. And on Sunday, November 13th at 2 p.m., Wesley United Method 100th and look what, look what God has done. According to the update, restart, renew best practices for in-person gathering, anyone present during this worship service should notify the church immediately if they test positive for COVID-19 within the next five days. Please remember the people on the prayer list and the words to encourage evangelism. Every day brings new opportunities to run the race for God, the upper room. Can we give our young people a hand? I'm so excited, and Wesley, can we give Wesley a hand? Because Wesley, you've trained these young people up. I thank the parents. I know I didn't see all of them that came through, but I thank you all for what you have poured into these children who have now become young adults. Um, I love it how I saw where they said, be so ever ready. When one person wasn't here for the scripture, somebody else stepped up immediately. Amen? And Wesley, I think, because I could hear Dr. Oma, if he didn't know a word or we could hear somebody, that's what we do. We stick together. The youth can show us how to be the church. Amen, somebody? Amen, chandeliers. But I, I don't want to take up your time. But I, it just blesses my soul. Because they, people always tell you they're the church of tomorrow. No, they're the church of today. Because if we don't train them today... They won't know how to be the church tomorrow. Wesley, you have done a phenomenal job. I give God glory for you all. Reverend Harrison, as I told you last year, would be with you for next Sunday. Reverend Jerry Harrison, a retired elder, 
will be with you next Sunday. If I can see the following people for just a moment after service, Ms. Alvester Robertson, Ms. Crystal Yarn, Ms. Ruby Stratford, Mr. DeArthur Jordan, and Mr. Stroman's not here. So I'll give you a message for him, Ms. Stroman. All right. And I guess everybody, and I'm going to do this as quickly as I can, and I'm taking the mic, but today is Laity Sunday. Every third Sunday in October, and if you can remember, Miss Ruby did it for us last um, third Sunday in October, but I'm going to go ahead, Laity, and put you on notice. You're going to have more speaking. We're going we're gonna to share it more this year because when they filled out their paperwork and I'm putting one, I'm just like, one? No, it's a shared ministry, so Laity, I'm putting you on notice. So make sure you know, but I'm going to ask the laity to come up, uh, Miss Tracy Stormer. And if you would stand right here, Miss Crystal Yawn, Miss Ruby Johnson, Miss Arlene Bates at home, we see you. Miss Frances McCullough, you can all can stand before the altar. Miss Frances McCullough is not here. This is just a token of appreciation to say we love you from Wesley. And whether you know it or not, Wesley, Laity comes. Miss Carmelita will be shared, will be joining us next year. She missed the class this year, but in March she will take the class. Um, I call Laity God's leadership team. Because if I don't have an appointment, I'll go back to my church and become Laity. They're right under the pastor. They hold, you know how Moses needed his arms held up so they could keep winning? That's what your laity does for your pastor. You, they hold their arms up. So this is just a token of appreciation from myself and Wesley to say that we love you. Thank you so much for all that you've done, all that you will continue to do in the future. And I'm going to give this to Dr. McCullough for Ms. Francis, if you would present that to her from Wesley. Thank you. Ms. Bates, I will drop yours off. To Ms. Crystal, we could never pay you just a token of your appreciation from Wesley. And I have one for your present lay leader, Ms. Bates, that will be dropped off to Ms. Bates for all that she has done, and for your new lay leader that will begin in January, Ms. Ruby Stratford. We just want to say that we love you. I'll get a picture with you ladies after service. And Wesley, thank you for all you do and have that. You had them in place when I got here. Thank you for making my job easy. I love you. All youth, please see Miss Oma up front after church for your treat bags. And she said, thank you for such an awesome job. And even the WebEx listeners say how plain you all are and what a great job you do. So we're going to ask you to stand and get ready for... We'll now have the closing hymn, The Struggle is Over, followed by the benediction. May heaven you are, but ever you be. Oh, when through God said, the struggle is over for you. It's Oh, it's 
long enough to know this life has been rough. It's called over. The struggle is over for you. And I don't know who the Holy Spirit is ministering to, but as those youth were up here, if you notice, one didn't leave the other one behind. They look to see, to make sure that we're together. I heard the Holy Spirit say, Wesley, don't leave nobody behind. We need to look back because there's a few people that we're leaving behind. Wesley, we got to stop and help them. We got to pick them up. We can't just talk about them. They've fallen by the wayside, church. We got to call them and see what happened to them. We got to not only check on the ones we know about, Wesley, but we've got we, some people, we've left some people behind. Remember, forgive so you can be forgiven. When you harbor hate, she said it best, you become bitter. Even if you don't become bitter, church, you become stuck. You're so fixated on your heart that you take your eye off of Jesus. And the enemy have a way of speaking and making you think it's God and it's not. Because God is going to tell you make it right. I don't know who he's ministering to. But we're going to go out in the world and share this word this morning. Forgive so you can be forgiven. Lord, we thank you for your word, God. We thank you, God, for the stirring that's taking place in Wesley, God. We thank you for the awakening in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for our youth this morning, God. We thank you for every member that calls themselves Wesley. Speak to our hearts, God. We're hungry for you, God. We want to be in your will, God. And you told us in your word, God, that a righteous man's steps are ordered by God. Order our steps, God. Speak to us, God, and let us know what you need us to do, God, because it's not going to get better until your saints stand up and be the church that you called us to be. God. Take away that spirit of fear, God, that you shouldn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. God, help us to walk in that authority this week, God. You have placed us in positions, God, where we can walk in with a boldness, God, and we can minister to others, God. We have to stop being judges, God, and be witnesses in the name of Jesus. Help us witness this week, God. Now may the love of God the sweet, sweet, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit. Rest, rule, and abide with us henceforth and forevermore. We all sing together. Cause we're gonna win this fight. Standing to the red sea, continue to save.